Good morning, everyone. My name is Tara Cormier, and I'm a woman in long-term recovery. What that means to me is that I found freedom from active addiction on July 13th, 2013. Thank you. This is the opioid and stimulant crisis panel. Um, we have a few announcements. So first, I would like to welcome you to the 2022 World Convention. Lanyards and name badges are required to enter all sessions. Please silent your cell phones during all breakout sessions. If you have a side conversation, we ask that you take it into the hallway. Please do not smoke or vape near hotel entr entrances, and please don't vape in the hotel. Please dispose of all cigarette butts properly and safely, no littering. Feel free to take notes during the sessions to bring back to your chapters and areas. We will open at the end of this panel with a Q&A session, so please hold all questions till the end. Today we are gonna be covering um, everything opioid and Matt and Mar related. Medication assisted treatment is currently offered to most individuals seeking recovery from opioid addiction. Oxford Houses will accept an applicant using MAT as long as there is a vacancy and the applicant demonstrates a commitment to recovery and the willingness to use only prescribed medication. The panel will discuss how to deal with opioid overdoses. Most Oxford House residents don't relapse, but occasionally it will happen. Relapse is most likely to have newcomers Excuse me, reverse. Relapse is most likely to happen during the early stages of recovery of, res of residency in an Oxford house. Therefore, Oxford houses are strongly encouraged to have newcomers share a room with another resident for socialization purposes and to check on behavior that may suggest a relapse. Relapse always requires immediate expulsion. Opioid overdoses can be fatal and residents should be aware of what action should be taken if a resident is believed to have, re to have overdosed. Once the immediate crisis is over, residents can move on to expulsion as the Oxford House Charter requires. This panel will discuss how to recognize overdoses and what, what actions Oxford House residents should take to respond to a possible overdose by a resident. Naloxone and other antidotes can save the life of an opioid abuser who has overdosed. Oxford Houses typically keep an overdose antidote on hand. All House members should know the signs of an overdose and what to do in the event of a relapse or an overdose. The panelists are all knowledgeable about overdoses and how to deal with them. They will provide valuable guidance to Oxford House residents who may have to deal with an overdose in their Oxford House. So today we are gonna have the best of the best on opioid and MAR education. First up, we have Elizabeth Smith. Elizabeth is a survivor of eight opioid overdoses. She has been in long-term recovery. She has been in long-term recovery since March 8, 2010. She has worked for Oxford House for four and a half years. Elizabeth is an advocate for the many pathways through recovery and sits on several work groups and task forces to train on opioid use disorder and overdose prevention and reversal throughout her community. Elizabeth Smith is currently the training and education coordinator for Oxford House in Oregon. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Elizabeth, and I am a person in long-term recovery. The only reason that that is possible is because the last time I overdosed, March 7, 2010, somebody had the training and the knowledge to use naloxone and to help me start my recovery journey. So first thing that I want to talk to you about, this chart right here, shows overdoses. This shows the lives lost. You look at that blue line right there, it just keeps going up. 
The last one recorded is not even on the chart. In the year 2021, we lost 107,375 people to overdoses. Opioids were involved in over 70% of all of those overdoses. Fentanyl is killing one person every 8.57 minutes. What that means is by the time this panel is done, we've lost another 13 people. I want you guys to think about that. That's more than this first row right here. So who's at risk for an overdose? It used to be, oh, you don't use opioids, it's not a problem, right? That's changed. So currently fentanyl can be found in all drugs. You are at risk for an opioid overdose if you have ever or if you are ever going to use any kind of a street drug or a prescription opioid. Last year, the National Institute of Drug Abuse reported that in over 75% of the cocaine fatalities, fentanyl was present. In over 50% of methamphetamine fatalities, fentanyl, again, was present. The one that scares the hell out of me is that they are now sprinkling fentanyl on top of marijuana. That 12-year-old kid like me, smoking weed behind her junior high school, could have possibly died of a fentanyl overdose. It is literally in everything. That penny right there shows you exactly how much fentanyl it takes to kill the average adult. Two milligrams. Those couple of little specks you can hardly even see is all that it would take to kill somebody in this room. So what can you do to help prevent an overdose in Oxford House, in your Oxford House? Well, the first thing, when you interview people, that's where that starts, right? How you welcome them into your house, the questions that you ask them, finding out if they have a path of their recovery, if they know what their plan is. If not, maybe sharing some of that information with them. You don't have to know what you're going to be doing or who you're going to be when you interview at an Oxford house. We're there to help you, right? When that person moves into the house, I can tell you right now, my best decisions literally killed me multiple times before I got to Oxford house. My thoughts were that I needed a single room. I didn't need to be on a getting to know you period or blackout right? I should be able to have over whoever I wanted. I should be able to come and go as I please. Thankfully, the house that I moved into didn't think that. <laughs> they put me in a shared room. They put me on a getting to know you contract where I was to be in by 10 p.m. every day of the week. They had me fill out a recovery plan. They insisted that I do some form of recovery meetings. But the other thing that those women did is they all got to know me. Each one of them had a role in that. They sat down with me when I first came into the house. They then helped me move all my items into my room, asked me what I needed. There was a pillow and a blanket on my bed when I got there. There was a cupboard that had food for me in it if I needed it. They gave me toiletry items, and they kept bugging me. They did not leave me alone. So not only when you're welcoming in, show them their room, show them some extra toiletry items, food items, get to know them. Tell them where the naloxone is. Give them a brief overview of how to use it. These are your family members, the houses, that are strong on unity, that remember that, that have those dinners together, that keep bugging that roommate when you don't see them. I can tell you right now, not only is it really important to engage that newcomer, 
it is vitally important to keep those long-term members around too. So we had an instance with a member in a house in Portland. He'd lived there for over two years. Really amazing guy. He decided one evening to do cocaine. They found him dead from a fentanyl overdose that next morning. When I asked those men what had been going on with him, you know what they told me? We thought he had stopped taking his medication. That's why he was acting off. So when you see those behaviors, talk to them about it. You never know when that brother or sister is on their way out, okay? Recovery. You guys know where you live? You live in a recovery house. That's what Oxford House is. I don't care what your recovery looks like. Be working an active program of recovery. Be a participant in your own growth and wellness. Whatever that looks like in your area, some people do smart recovery. Some people do 12-step recovery. Uh, we have Dharma recovery, CBT. C you know what I'm trying to say here. I can't get the initials. You got it. Yeah. Uh, DBT, all of those different types. Some people use religion, nature. We have this cool thing that just started called the recovery gym in Oregon, where they have peer professionals that work through workouts with you and recovery while you're doing it. Be engaged. Be doing something to better yourself. I was going to end with saying everybody should hear about overdose reversal education, but I need to tell you a little story. Last night, I'm in my room about 10.30 at night, and I get a text message from one of the members. They just lost one of their alumni to a fentanyl overdose. Alumni. So we're talking about what to do in your Oxford house. That also means keeping those who have moved out safe, keeping them engaged, keeping them involved, especially when you hear that they're not doing well. If you're not comfortable with that, you have senior members in your area that will gladly do it for you. But let's not let other people get lost to this disease. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth touched on some really important things. Um, in Oxford House, the concept that we have of living together as a family is super important. And we wouldn't go two or three days without checking on our baby brother or our mother. And that's a really important thing to do um, in, within your houses. So, uh, and accountability too. Not pulling someone up on their behavior can be fatal. So just take that as a reminder that we're there to love and support each other every step of the way. And it's not always the newcomer who's the sick and suffering. Our seasoned members, our core members, they go through hard times and struggles too. And it's equally as important that we're checking on them and, and checking on their behaviors. So Will Madison's next. <laughs> Okay, you, nobody laughed at my cuteness. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is so, let me just say something. This is super serious. You know, this is a super serious topic. Um, and it, it, it can be, you know, a little somber, but um, I'm like a loud kind of person, and it's okay to laugh and, and to be comfortable here. This is a safe space for us all to talk about, a very hard topic. So Will Madison is currently a training and education coordinator in the state of North Carolina and has held that position since 2017. Previously, he was an outreach services representative for Oxford House Inc. for Greensboro, High Point, and Winston-Salem area of North Carolina. He has been in long-term recovery since 2011 and has been working for Oxford House Inc. since 2012. Will Madison. Thank you, Tara. Um, my name is Will. I'm an addict. Hey, Will. Um, I, uh, first, I just want to say I'm honored to be on the stage with these individuals. Um, 
Every one of them is super passionate about this topic, uh, and it all boils down to being able to provide um, someone that chance and that opportunity that we were given. Um, so I get to talk about um, something that's stigmatized even further than just being an addict, an alcoholic. Um, and, and I meet every presentation that I do on this topic with a level of understanding um, because I do understand. I understand there's a stigma associated to MAT, MAR, medication-assisted treatment, medication-assisted recovery. Um, so I get it, you know, and, and, and I'll just give you a... I was in another panel just a few minutes ago uh, for, for another population of, of people, addicts, that are also very stigmatized. Uh, and I've heard that word used so many times already this week about stigmatizing, uh, stigmatizing behavior uh, and things of that sort. And, you know, when I got clean, it was hard. It was very hard. And I can't, I really can't imagine, you know, it was already stigmatized against just being, you know, an addict. Um, and I can't imagine another element being thrown into the mix to be stigmatized against, uh, whether that's, you know, medication, uh, the color of my skin, you know, whatever the case may be. So I truly can't imagine what that is like. And for those of you who have felt that, I feel for you. I empathize with you because um, that's just got to be tough. I, I, I truly think that we as Oxford House family can do better to support one another. Um, you know, whatever, whatever that looks like. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about medication-assisted treatment, if I can get my phone to unlock, uh, and medication-assisted recovery. Um, you know, when I, when I first came into the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous, I was told, you know, stick with the winners, you know, find somebody, talk to people. Uh, so I go do that. And, uh, you know, I'm talking to folks. I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to ask that guy to sponsor me. And one of my predecessors, the old timers in the room, said, no, 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 do not talk to that guy. He's taking Suboxone. Uh, and this was, you know, 11 years ago. And I said, okay, you know, this guy's been clean 20 years, 10 years, whatever the case may be, and he tells me not to do that. So I'm going to follow those suggestions like I was told. Um, so that's truly where this, stigma, where this stigmatized behavior comes from uh, was the rooms, the 12-step groups. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's opinions and personal experiences that tie into it as well. Uh, but for me, that's what I heard, and that's what, I was, okay, no problem. Um, so as this opioid epidemic started to really show its nasty face, um, Oxford House identified uh, a need for some training and education uh, on these particular topics. Um, so, you know, they didn't send me to some elaborate school to go get training and learn how to do all this stuff. Um, what it really boiled down to is some of those spiritual principles uh, of understanding, tolerance. Um, and that was really the start of it. And, and the way this whole training program started was with um, real Oxford House residents' feedback. So we put a survey out uh, in North Carolina to, to evaluate what do we need to address? What are the issues? What are the misconceptions? So we got real responses back from you guys, folks in the houses dealing with us in the front line, because it was important for us to take an inside-out approach. You know, we're not going to worry about what they did, what the, what the opinion of it was 10, 15, 30 years ago. We're talking about today, because we're seeing it every day in our houses. And how do we support these individuals? So we got feedback from uh, individual residents on what it is that we need to address. How can we help? Um, so in the training, um, we'll go over some of these things here, uh, and I'll, I'll go into each of them a little bit further. Um, but the biggest thing that I noticed early on was this word treatment. Um, we're not treatment. Oxford House is not treatment. And houses would, would push back and say, um, you know, we're not a treatment center. We're not providing treatment. So it evolved. So medication-assisted recovery 
uh, because this is a pathway of recovery. And I'm not going to say it's a pathway to recovery because this is a pathway of recovery. Um, that means that somebody who's utilizing medication uh, paired with some sort of counseling component, uh, they are in recovery. Um, I'll get into it a little later, but you heard Dr. Wesley Clark describe what uh, the working definition of recovery was. Um, so the big thing to take away from this slide is the word assisted. And the word assisted is one part of that, per of that person's treatment plan. So if that's um, group support, um, outpatient therapy, whatever that case may be, um, that's paired with this. We're not simply talking about going to your family doctor, getting a prescription of Suboxone, taking it as you are prescribed, but nobody's evaluating. Nobody's determining, is your dose correct? Are they getting what they need? Are they still having cravings of using? You know, that kind of thing. So we've got to have that component in there. We've got to be able to evaluate, have the medical professional evaluate um, where that person is. Do they need, you know, do they need more? Do they need less? Uh, so these types of medications you'll see commonly uh, for medication-assisted treatment and recovery, uh, Suboxone or Subutex, Methadone, Vivitrol, Sublocade. Um, and, and I share those with you because if you don't know what to look for uh, when you're interviewing somebody, and, and I'll tell you, somebody who is so stigmatized already um, because of being on medication-assisted treatment or recovery, more than likely, they're not going to come into their interview and say, hey, I'm on MAT, I'm on MAR, and this is it. So you as houses, as residents in the houses, should be able to see on the application, because when they fill out an application, I know down there on the bottom right, it asks for medications used. So if you see types of medications like that, a bell should go off, okay, you know, that would prompt you. Well, what does your treatment plan look like? What, where do you, do you go to counseling? Do you go to group group therapy, what, what does that look like? You would hold them accountable to that just the same as you would anybody else who is, is uh, doing outpatient treatment after they've completed their inpatient portion. So you go Tuesdays and Thursdays at 3 p.m., you know, we want to make sure that you do that. We want to hold you accountable to that. Um, so that, that's the reason that those are on there. The most common misconception or issue that, that arises with this is um, someone who is receiving the appropriate dose uh, will show no signs of being medicated. No signs or symptoms of being medicated. And I'll repeat that because if, they're repeat, if they are receiving the appropriate dose, there will be no sign that they are medicated. And that is the appropriate way for medication-assisted treatment to be used. Um, if you think about any medication you take, if you don't get the right dose there's probably some sort of side effect, would you say? Yeah. So it's no different here. If they're not getting the right dose, then, you know, hey, well, let's figure this out. We need to, we need to take this a step further. Uh, but if they're getting the correct dose from their doctor, taking as prescribed, um, you should see no signs of, of being medicated. The difference being that some of the medications that they use for this um, you know, it might get heavy eyes, slurred speech, may even appear to be nodding out. Um, those are just things to look for. And if that happens, let's, let's, let's take this a step further. Let's talk as a house. Let's figure out how we can support this individual. So in, uh, with medication-assisted treatment programs uh, or recovery programs, everyone's different. Everyone's brain chemistry is different. If you were in the panel uh, yesterday with um, Dr. Gitlow, uh, you kind of heard about a brain chemistry and all that, and that's way over my head. I'm not even going to pretend to get into that. But what I can tell you is every individual's dose may differ. The length of time they're taking the medication may differ. Um, and their actual counseling component may differ. You know, it might look the same in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, as it does uh, in Greenville, but it might, it might look very, very different in your part of the state or your city uh, from your neighboring city. And it's all about the provider who is, who is offering this service. So in a perfect world, it would look the same across the board, but we, we just haven't got there yet. Um, so if they go to counseling once a week and that's their component, 
That's what it is. But you need to find out what that looks like. So just because one person's plan looked this way and they were receiving this dose and this many times for this period of time doesn't mean that anyone else will have the same, same model there. Uh, so it will differ, and you need to understand that. Um, so the big thing about this, um, you know, it's, we're discriminating, really. We're discriminating against individuals when we don't accept or we have this wall up that, no, no, this is not in recovery. You're not going to move into my Oxford house. Uh, well, what we're doing is we're actually discriminating against uh, the same law that allows you to be in that Oxford house. You know, that Fair Housing Act protects you and allows us to be there and live together under one roof. Um, and that same law is protecting this individual. So we're, we're reaping the benefits of one law, but we're holding it up against someone else. So um, just understand, it's illegal to discriminate. We can't, we can't tell someone, no, you're not moving in here because you're taking this medication. You know, that's, you cannot do that. Um, we have to provide what's called a reasonable accommodation. Uh, you know, one, the housing is the reasonable accommodation. Uh, another thing that came out with, with that survey years ago was um, we don't want medications in our house. We don't want that medication in our house. Um, and, and in reality, you know, with any medication, you've heard of probably personal lock boxes where houses will purchase these lock boxes or have the individual purchase this lock box. Uh, and that's where it's to be stored. So they're responsible for it. Nobody's dispensing any medication whatsoever, um, even if it's not one of these. Nobody dispenses someone else's medication. Um, if that person cannot take their medication as prescribed on their own and they actually need somebody else to do it for them, then they're not really a candidate for Oxford House. That's just not what we do. Um, we're not medical professionals, we're not nurses, doctors, or at least we're not that person's doctor or nurse. And if you are living in the house and you have a patient there, that's probably a problem too. So um, we have to provide that reasonable accommodation. And then the guidelines of the medication. Um, they are to follow the guidelines of that medication. You know, how is it prescribed? Uh, how frequently are they taking it? Um, like any other medication. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel here just with this one medication. So don't play doctor, focus on behaviors. These are some that came out of that survey. Um, they're pretty disturbing when you think about it. When you're thinking about somebody who, who is wanting to do the same thing that you want to do and stay clean and sober, and uh, it's only for the week. That was a real Oxford House resident response, that it's only for the week. If you take medication-assisted treatment medication, you're weak. Um, Long-term use is bad. Another one right from an Oxford House resident. Um, I don't know who determines that, but in this case, it's the doctor. How long does that person need to be on the medication? And I'll be honest with you, you can be on that medication for 30 days, 60 days, 6 months, 10 years, or indefinitely. If that's what that individual needs, we just, we're here to support them. That's okay. Um, and, and the way I always look at it is if that's what that individual needs to, to get the same benefits out of recovery that I am, I'm supporting that. And that's just what it is for me because it doesn't really bother me that that person needs that medication and I didn't. Um, I've I just never been able to wrap my head around that one. But this last one is what I mentioned earlier, that it's not true recovery. Well, what is true recovery? And I, and I ask... You know, if I went, even in this first row here, there's five people. Uh, if I asked what true recovery was to each one of these five people, I imagine I'd get very different answers because recovery is different for every person. Um, but SAMHSA, and you heard Dr. Wesley Clark yesterday probably describe that, um, what true recovery is. And it's a process of change, and I want you to think about it as I read it and see if it relates to, to your definition of recovery a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. So that's better than any definition I could ever give for what recovery is. Um, but just think about that. And last, we'll go through um, a couple of these questions that came up based on the initial survey. 
Can a house accept someone on MAT or MAR? Well, that's a no-brainer. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and we do it every day. Uh, and if you haven't seen medication-assisted treatment or recovery um, come into your area or to your house, you will. Because this is like the number one approach to opiate use disorder nowadays. You know, if I went to treatment today, 99% sure I'd be prescribed this medication. Uh, from a doctor, not because I wanted it or asked for it, because that's what they're trying to do to combat what Elizabeth and, and Casey and Seth will talk about is that overdose. Uh, so this is a prevention tactic uh, for, for the overdoses that we see. Can we taper members down or stop medication? Well, I'll tell you, this is the, one of those things where your house autonomy cannot do. You cannot tell someone that they need to be off this medication at a certain date, or you need to go on a taper. You know, you can do that dose for this month, but next month you need to be here. Well, you're not the doctor, and you're playing with someone's life when you say that. Um, do we have to expel members showing side effects? Well, I'll answer that two ways, and I want to pair it with the next question is, what do we do if the dose seems too high? So, do we expel members who uh, are showing side effects? Well, not necessarily. Um, anytime something like that happens with any other medication, what do you do as a house? You call an emergency meeting, say, hey, we noticed that there's some behaviors. We want to talk to you and see what's going on. Maybe that's a time where you have the individual count their medication, make sure everything adds up, everything's good. Um, so no, not necessarily. Now, if you go in there and you're, you're realizing that, well, there's like 16 tabs or pills or whatever missing, well, that's going to prompt another question because now they're taking their medication. Uh, they're not taking it the right way. Um, so you don't necessarily go straight off that behavior. Oh, they look high. They look like they might be. Uh, and we're going to have an emergency meeting and vote them out. Have a conversation. Have a house meeting. Talk to the individual. Find out what's going on. Um, because what can happen is their dose can be off. And it can be off from... The first 30 days, maybe it was perfect. 60 days in, uh, now it doesn't seem like it's the right dose. So any medication you take like this uh, will have to be altered or adjusted over time. Um, where do they keep it? Obviously in that lockbox we talked about in their room, not in the house lockbox where your money orders go. Um, and what can we require from members on these medications? Well, they're not going to come in and say, hey, I've got this certificate here. I'm, medication assisted. Uh, that's not what this is. Um, you can ask, you know, just like if I were to interview in your house and I'm, I'm supposed to go to outpatient treatment three days a week, ask those questions. Hold them accountable. Um, that's really what we're doing with everyone, so it's really no different with that. Um, but again, I think I'm running out of time, so um, <laughs> I appreciate you letting me share. Thank you. Yeah, I let them run over. It was important stuff. And I'm just going to make a notation, all right? In 2015, I'm from New Jersey. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, Cynthia. Um, the opioid epidemic was crushing us in 2015. It was horrible. I hope no one ever has to experience what we experienced in New Jersey. In 2017, 57 Oxford House residents died in their houses. That's more than one per week, okay? And what saved us? This year we lost three people. Our goal is always zero, okay? In 2022, we've lost three people. And it's because of the inclusion of MAR and these opioid trainings. So. One thing that makes me really mad <laughs> is when someone is behind on their EES or not going to meetings and they say that so-and-so is not in recovery because they're on a medication, all right? So take out your little mirror and chill out because you're incorrect. What we're doing by including Mar in our homes is saving people's lives. 57 New Jersey Oxford House residents died. I don't want you to forget. 
because that's 57 houses that had to work through the trauma of finding or losing one of their roommates, 57 families that lost their loved one when they thought they were going to a safe place. We need to continue to make our houses as safe as possible for people in recovery. And that's all. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so up next, we have Casey Longin. Casey Longin is the training and education coordinator for Texas. She has been employed with Oxford House Inc. since September 1st, 2018. Her sobriety date is September 14th, 2011. She is an alumnus of Oxford House from Oregon. Before her employment with OHI, she worked as a recovery coach in the San Antonio area and has a background in the research field and was also previously employed by DePaul University out of Chicago, where she worked as a research manager conducting studies on Oxford houses in several regions. She has a degree in criminal justice and is a national certified peer recovery support specialist. Casey. There we go. Good morning. So I can't stress everything enough about what everybody else has already talked about. Um, we also found out this morning that another life was lost last night. Um, it's not getting any better out there, right? We're all aware that we have to do better. We all have a lot of things going on in our lives. You guys get very busy living in a house. You start to gain things back, but we cannot forget about other people. You know, people bring it up all the time. Well, I'm only an alcoholic. Why do opioids matter to me? You're living in an Oxford house, right? Our, we didn't wake up one day and say, hey, my life is so great. I want to move into an Oxford house. This is going to be fun, right? That's not how that started. Um, we, <laughs> I'm just being real. Um, we all needed some help. We all needed some guidance. We needed a safe place to be, to gather ourselves, to get things back on track. And this is a never ending cycle. So we have to be the voice for other people that don't have their voice yet. We have to continue to be a voice for the people that we've lost and for those families and just as a whole. So I'm gonna get off that little soapbox real quick. <laughs> um, so signs of an overdose. This information is going to be very crucial for you guys, not only inside your houses, but everyday life. I mean, this is happening all over the place. You could be at the grocery store, you could be getting gas somewhere, and somebody might need your assistance. And more often than not, we're, especially in the houses, we're gonna be first people on scene before the professionals actually do arrive. So that photo is a real photo. I'm sure some people have seen that before. Um, what we took out of that is that there was a three-year-old child in the back seat of that vehicle, okay? Um, obviously, this does not discriminate. This can happen to anybody, anytime. It doesn't matter who's around. So some people came outside and found this vehicle parked a little sideways in the street and found this couple like that. Obviously, they are unresponsive. On the flip side of that, you can have somebody who may not be all the way unresponsive like that. They can kind of be mumbling, they're trying to talk, it can kind of mimic somebody being very drunk, and not all overdoses are going to look the same. Um, and that's due to what they've ingested, how their body has kind of reacted to that, the potency of what they've ingested. Um, their skin can be very pale, kind of a grayish white color to it, because the body is shutting down, right? So the oxygen is slowly starting to not work anymore, blood flow is not gonna be happening, and that's why the skin turns that color. Um, blue nails, so in the moment of checking for an overdose, you probably won't remember to check somebody's fingernails, but it is one of the signs. So right here at the cuticle line, it can be kind of a purplish blue tint, same thing with their lips. Um, when you do check a person's eyes, they're gonna be very small, so they're gonna have pinpoint pupils. And a very slow pulse if they are lucky enough to still be alive. And so you have to be mindful when you're checking for a pulse on somebody. You know, there's all sorts of crazy stuff out there. People, I've seen really ridiculous things. People just grab somebody to try to check for a pulse like that. You don't want to do that. You want to check right here on their neck. You can check on the wrist. And be mindful that when you're going through this situation, your own heart rate, everything is going to be out of whack for you as well. And so it can be very difficult. You need to know what you're doing when you're trying to find a pulse on somebody. 
and then labored breathing. So you heard it, the death gurgle, the death rattle. Who's heard that before in person? Okay, so it's a very distinct sound. It is a very scary sound for people. Oftentimes when we get feedback after doing these trainings um, and talk to people that have gone through this, they say that that's one of the scariest things to hear. Um, that is that person just trying to breathe. They're trying to take whatever air they have left in their body um, because that is one of the last things to happen, right, before somebody can pass away. Um, Narcan, amazing, right? Here's our Narcan, Narcan Vanna over here. It is very important. You should know what the Narcan looks like. Who does not have Narcan in their houses? You all got it? Does everybody know where it's at? Okay, good, perfect, okay. When you have new members that move in, show them where the Narcan is at. Don't just say it's over there on the shelf or whatever. Physically show them where it's at. There is a very short video on YouTube that you can pull up that will show them how to utilize that Narcan and how to use it. It is very simple. It's all the other stuff that can happen that freaks people out and it turns into a difficult situation. Um, so make sure that people are staying on top of that. Make sure um, when people leave Oxford House, they take information with them. So that's up to you guys to continue that cycle and continue teaching people as they move in. Um, there are some areas throughout the United States that don't have good access to Narcan. It's very unfortunate. If you went to go purchase a box, let, let's say you don't have funding in your area, you don't know where to get it. If you went to go purchase a box of Narcan on your own, if you had insurance, it's what? Yeah, somewhere, it's gonna vary in different areas. Sometimes it can be $75, $125. If you don't have insurance, you're looking at $225 or $275 for one box, that's two doses. Majority of the time, that isn't gonna do anything for anybody at this point. Um, and so it's unfortunate that, I mean, all Oxford houses should have access to it, all people should have access to it, but we're just not there yet. Um, these are all the different forms of Narcan. They all work equally as well. The one that falls under assembly, that's also a form of nasal. You have the syringe and vial, and I know people feel some type of way about that. They don't want anything to do with it. The only other alternative, if you feel uncomfortable using that, you're gonna stand there and watch somebody die. Who's willing to do that? Nobody right? You might freak out after the fact if you have to use that on somebody, but call your sponsor. Work through some stuff because if that is the only thing that's around to save somebody's life, you need to use it. It is very easy to use. All you would do is pull off that orange cap off of that vial. There it is there. Um, it is a pre-measured dose, what is in that vial, and the best place to give it to somebody, easiest spot, is going to be like a flu shot right in their arm. And then you also have the auto-injector, so this is a big one, right? People say they love it, it's so cool, it talks to you, it tells you what to do, but those are $3,500 for two. <laughs> so there's that, we don't have money for that. Um, yes, they are great, but it's very stupid. Those sources could go to supplying other people with that. Um, it, <laughs> yeah, I won't get started on that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So Narcan in your houses, talk about it. Every house meeting, it's gonna seem redundant, but it is what it is. Um, again, show people the video, have them watch that video, make sure that they know what they're doing. Do not lock it up. It is not gonna do anybody any good if it's locked up and the person with that key is not home. There have been issues like that in the past. There's no reason for it. Sometimes when people relapse, they may take that Narcan and take it with them. So be it. Right, not that big a deal. Contact your outreach if you need another dose or reach out to your um, county health departments if you need more doses. There is an expiration date on there. The FDA extended that expiration date of Narcan out to 36 months past whatever the date is that's on the box. But it really lasts about eight, nine years in the grand scheme of things. People freak out and they wanna throw it away or get rid of it or go, oh, it's close to the expiration date. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. Um, again, if you have access in your area, ask whoever to get more doses and then swap out. We, I know out in Texas, whenever I give houses new doses, we take those ones that we collect and I give them to a homeless outreach program. So it's going back out 
to people that don't have access to it. Um, and so you never want to get rid of it. I already talked about outreach and I'm trying to hurry. Um, okay, so this is really important. Who has experienced an overdose, either reversal or death, while living inside a house? Okay. And this is just a portion of the room, right? This isn't including everybody. Um, I'm glad that some of you have not had to go through that, but the probability is you will at some point. And so this is really important information to know what to do. When you call 911 to get help on the way, your next phone call needs to be to your outreach worker, so you have a staff that is gonna come over and help walk you guys through this process. There's a lot of things that go on when this happens. It gets very chaotic. Um, it's very, um, it's scary, it's sad. You're gonna go through a whole lot of different emotions and it's very helpful to have a staff member there. Um, so next thing, do not post anything on social media. And this is a big one. I have gotten pictures before from people taking Snapchat with an ambulance in the driveway, posting it on Facebook. I don't care what you got. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, don't do it. It's not a time to celebrate, oh, look what's going on here. This person almost lost their life. And you need to be mindful of that, right? It's not, this is such a huge deal. And people, I think, sometimes get so used to, unfortunately, people dying that it's just like another day. It's not another day. This shouldn't be another day, ever. It shouldn't be celebrated. We can't save everybody, but it is damn sure not a time to be posting somebody's worst moment on social media. You need to think about what if that was you? Whether opioids, it doesn't matter, whether opioids were your thing or not, let's say for the alcoholic that likes to bring that up, if you got really drunk and you fell down and cracked your head open, would you want people posting pictures of that moment on social media for other people to see? No. It doesn't matter what the situation is, so please be mindful of that. If you ever see that, call people on it. Have them take it down. Get the post removed. Um, next thing that will happen after that, obviously there's going to be an expulsion meeting. That person is no longer going to be a member of the house. Um, and that kind of ties in with documentation. There's going to be you know, stuff, make sure, meeting minutes. You guys are taking really good meeting minutes. And you follow through with that. Um, let's say that this individual decides to go seek medical attention. Which, by the way, they don't have to get in an ambulance. They don't have to go. We can't force them to go get medical attention. But the way that you speak to somebody when they do come out of this can really help them. You know, It's going to be a lot for you, but you got to try to do your best to hold it together and say, hey, we really think that you, know, you should go to the hospital. And I'll tell people all the time, a lot of people don't have insurance. They don't have the money to get in that ambulance ride, and that is a very sad piece that that's a deciding factor for somebody. If you're in a house, if you're solid in your sobriety, you are solid in knowing how to use Narcan, you have a vehicle, take them to the hospital. Go inside with them. Don't drop them off, because if it was me and somebody dropped me off, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go in, and I wouldn't do it. But having somebody there with you can really be helpful for them. And so again, if you're solid in all that stuff, go with them and show some love and compassion to them. Um, so let's say they go get that help. They come back to the house. They're no longer going to be a member. We don't ever want to send people away, pointing the finger at them, saying, how could you do that to this house? How could you disrespect us? What were you thinking? They don't need that. That's the last thing that they need. And trust me, they're going to be beating themselves up enough especially when they're coming back to the place where everybody loved them, liked them, you know, a few hours ago, whatever that looks like, and now everybody's being mean, they want to turn their backs, and we bring it up because it happens all the time. They don't need that. The way that you need to show love and compassion is to say, hey, you know, here's some openings, at this detox, or whatever it looks like. Give them those phone numbers. Sit down with them. Send them away with some information and make sure that they're going somewhere safe. Our jobs don't end caring for people because they almost just died. If anything, it needs to step up more. Yes. Um, don't schedule a training with me. I mean, you can. You can. Um, <laughs> you can. Um, but yeah, so when, you, when they go, talk about this. Don't ball it up you know, with inside the house. Talk about what's going on. Um, it's going to be a lot for you guys, and that's something that you guys need to work on also inside the house. A lot of times people feel a lot of guilt, and they say, well, 
I kind of noticed something was going on with him, but I didn't really want to rock the boat. I'm going to tell you about rocking the boat, right? So <laughs> if you see something, say something. This is your home. It doesn't matter how new you are to the house, how long you've been there. you got to talk about stuff. Because if you're not talking about it, you're adding to the problem and you're helping kill that person. By staying silent, we're killing people. All right, this is what to do after the event of a fatal overdose. Same things are going to apply. Notify your outreach um, while 911 is being called. A lot of things are going to happen. Your house is going to get very busy. How much time do I got? OK. Um, all right. All, okay, let me back up. I know people feel some type of way about the police, right? How many felons we got in the room? All right, there we are. <laughs> um, people on parole, probation. So people freak out about this. In that moment, all of that has to go away. All that they know when they arrive on scene is that they've gotten dispatched a call that there is a deceased individual inside of a house, and then they arrive on scene. Most of the time, they're not going to know, understand, or even care what an Oxford house is. But when they arrive, there's multiple people living under one roof. So obviously, they're going to have to investigate. They're going to go into the house. They're going to see what's going on. Um, be respectful of that. Let them do their jobs. It's not a time for us to freak out or you know, be rude to them. They have a job to do as well. Um, we have to let them notify next of kin. We've had situations in the past where people have contacted family members or friends, and so we've had moms and other family members arrive on scene while that person's body is still in the house. That creates a whole other scenario. We have to be respectful um, and let the police handle that part. And sometimes it can take a little bit for them to notify somebody to, and, or find somebody to do the de death notification to. Sometimes there's not any family left. So we have to be respectful of that time frame. How to handle the scene, again, um, there's no nice way to talk about it. So somebody that's overdosed and died within minutes or even a couple of hours, there may not be a whole lot of cleanup or stuff left behind. Compared to somebody that has been dead for several days, and this happens way more than it should. By then, the body has broken down. There's lots of body fluids, and I won't get into all that. You guys know. Um, so the scenes can look very different. Sometimes when the police go in and all of this is cleared out and they say that they've cleared the scene, there's drugs left behind, there's other paraphernalia, there's all the medical equipment that can be left behind. Again, this is where staff members um, and other individuals can come in and help walk you guys through this process because it can be a lot, um, especially for newer people in the house. Um, and it never gets any easier. Staying off of social media, we should not be seeing RIP posts within minutes. Again, this is going to go back to being respectful of the time, respectful that people probably haven't even been notified yet that their loved one is gone. There's going to be a time and place to make those posts on social media, um, but directly after is not the time nor the place to do that. House and chapter support, it's going to be very important. You're houses, the, the membership, people are going to want to check on you guys to see how you're doing. Um, so you're going to have probably people popping over to visit, bringing you food, flowers, all of that stuff. Be accepting of that help because it is coming from a good spot. But if you have not had time to grieve together as a house, you got to speak up. Talk to your chapter officers and say, hey, we really need some time together as a house. But we don't know that. We won't know that unless you guys speak up. Um, but it is coming from a place of love and support for having other people check on y'all. Professional support, very important for some people. Some people can get through the death process and not need any professional support. Sometimes other people need that, and we have to be respectful of that. Just because you see somebody um, getting through that process a little different than somebody else doesn't mean that they cared any less. People just process things different. Um, if you need professional support, uh, referral resources, stuff like that, there is access to that. There's lots of places um, to go for that, and I'm sure that your, your staff can give you guys that access. Um, documentation, so there's going to be an incident report that's filled out. The cops are going to question you as well. They're going to get statements from you guys. This is kind of along the same lines. We have documentation that we need as staff also. 
And I assure you that we're not being cold, we're not being invasive by asking for that, but we have a time frame in which we have to get that turned in as well. Um, and then short and long-term effects. So you might be okay one day, or even for a couple months, and then let's say you're doing your chore, because we all like chores, right? Chores, yeah? Um, you might be listening to music or whatever, and it might trigger something, you know, a memory from that person. Go through that process. It's okay to feel those feelings. You're gonna go through a range of emotions. You're gonna be sad, you're gonna be scared, you're gonna be upset, you're gonna be mad. All of those things are gonna come into play. But just be mindful of that and talk about it. I don't care how tough you are. When you see that person's body getting wheeled out of that house by the medical examiner, it's a game changer. It gets real, real quick when that happens. And you're not going to forget it. And for those of you who haven't gone through that, I hope that you don't have to go through that. But just know that there is help out there. Um, there's another thing, stigmatize, help. Oh, we can't talk to people. Well, thank God we have professionals to talk to. I'm just being honest with that. Some of us really need that. Um, and I think this is it. I'm going to close with this. If you don't see somebody in your house, don't be afraid to knock on that door. Don't be afraid to ask them how they're doing. It doesn't matter if you're brand new to a house. Your voice matters just as much as anybody else in the house. And I think that sometimes that gets forgotten. When you move into an Oxford house, you assume the responsibility to look out for those individuals that you live with, and if you can't do that, then you need to move out. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. Um, naloxone is the coolest thing ever. One of the really cool things about naloxone is that if you use it and the person is not overdosing, it's gonna have absolutely no effect on them. And uh, with that, I'll, exp I'll tell you guys something, because I know for, for sure, because I saw it happen one day. Um, there's two of these in the pack. So it, back in New Jersey, we had a really big grant program where our houses were flooded with these very expensive units. And there's a white one, and then this blue one. The white one is the trainer. So it'll walk you through. You know where this is going, huh? Yeah. The white one will walk you through the steps of an overdose. So I was at... Um, uh, Newark, New Jersey, for those who are familiar. I was at their chapter meeting, and they were doing a little mini Narcan training, and the guy had the blue one in his hand, and it said, place on your inner thigh and push down. So he put it on his inner thigh and pushed down, and he was like, ah, and that needle went right into his muscle. And it comes out like two, three inches into your thigh. So yeah, everything was cool. We did lose one of the units, but uh, it was a really funny experience. And uh, you know, anybody can use these things. These are great, as well as the other aspirators. And after we do Q&A too, please feel free to come up. You can see Devin. He's one of our special guests today and all of our other kits. You can touch them, look at them, and ask any questions. Up next, we have Seth Dewey. Uh, Seth Dewey is not on the program. He is our special guest today. We are so lucky to have him. Um, I could go on and on about how wonderful he is, but I will let him tell his story. Seth Dewey. All right. Thank you guys for, for letting me be here. Thanks, Casey. Um, it's really an honor to be uh, able to talk about this important subject, especially with, with such fine people here. So um, I am from the state of Kansas and also, and also am a person in recovery. And I started my journey of recovery on July 23rd of 2017. So, <clears throat> so I'm from one of those states where naloxone is super hard to come by. It's getting easier because of a lot of the people from Kansas in recovery that are in this room, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk a little bit about how being in an Oxford house can not only change the trajectory of your life and the people in your house's lives, but also your community because of things like this that these guys are telling you right now. Now, Kansas is very unique in the sense that we don't have outreach, right? So we don't always get these cool trainings and like the, the naloxone and all this cool stuff, right? So sometimes we have to get creative, but that presents opportunity at times as well, 
okay? So in 2018, there were a bunch of us and we were really sad, okay? But we were also really mad because there were a bunch of our friends that had died of overdoses in our small county in Kansas, Reno County. Three of our uh, friends that lived in Oxford houses died, okay? But there were also 15 other people that died that year. And this is a small county, you know what I'm saying? So these were big numbers. And so what we decided to do after seeing state conventions and seeing on social media what, what these individuals were doing was we're like, we're gonna copy them. <laughs> Somehow, we're gonna do it. Now, we didn't have as much uh, resources at the time, so one of our alumni got a hold of Casey and put us in contact with Texas um, with a, a program there that got us naloxone for our Oxford houses. And so at least we started there for our chapter in Reno County to have naloxone. And we started doing monthly trainings at every chapter meeting. And word got out in this small rural community really quick of what we were doing. Because we're, well, we're loud about things. You know what I mean? And it caught on really quick and we started telling the police and the sheriff that they should also be doing these things. You guys should be carrying it too. And they said, no. Their attitude was, and I quote, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah. I'm glad you said it, because I didn't have to from the stage. So anyway, so things went on. So in 2019, we started a, a nonprofit called, well, before it was a nonprofit, it was called Addicts Against Overdose, and then we started using a little more politically correct language for our actual nonprofit called Kansas Recovery Network. And we started getting naloxone in the intramuscular format, because it's so much cheaper. And in Kansas, we didn't have a lot of those grant funds. And so we started uh, making it more available to the community. And then we got a new chief of police and he approached me and he said, you guys in Oxford houses in this recovery community are making us look really bad. We got some funding for Narcan. Can you help us write a sample policy at least? Because we need to start having our officers carry Narcan. That was one win. Now the sheriff's department was a whole nother ball game because these guys are like jack boots, crew cuts, military background. When they approached us with the same question, that was a big one. So, uh, so both of them started carrying Narcan and uh, we actually were the ones who did their trainings as well. So that was pretty cool. So, in 2020, it, it, it just was catching fire in this community, right? It was catching fire. And in 2020, the community was like, we need someone in recovery to start doing more and to, to manage some of our funding that's coming in because it was, it was just everybody was wanting to know more about overdose prevention and all these new things, medications for opioid use disorder, because we had no one that was offering MAR or MAT services in this county, but we were talking about it. We were letting them know. And so the health department hired me <laughs> at, at, for the county, for a county job, and all I had was felonies on my resume, right? So it was really cool. Um, and so then, and then the next thing you know, I'm the project coordinator for federal grants for overdose prevention strategies and substance misuse strategy, right? <laughs> Working with the Bureau of Justice, the Department of Justice, and the Office of Intergovernmental Research. What in the world? <laughs> is this real life? So the cool thing about it though, guys, is it all started right here right here in Oxford House, okay? With these trainings that every single one of us gets, and you guys get even more with your outreach. 
Use it. Use it. And if you're in a spot where you don't have it, create it. Create it. Make it happen. We hustled out there, right? We have not lost that ability. Okay? We have not. We, we have even more ability now. Come on. All right? So here's the thing. We have increased these things in Reno County, these strategies. Okay, so we, we, we saw the statistics of over 107,000 lives lost last year. That's astronomical. In Kansas, we saw 680 overdose fatalities. That's large for a rural state. In fact, it was a 43% increase from the previous year, making Kansas the second highest state in overdose fatality increase, not in numbers overall, but in the increase. We were the second highest state. Reno County had 29 overdose fatalities in itself last year, and we're able to tell this in real time because of the strategies that people in recovery started to implement with our overdose mapping tracking system. This year, I think this is wood, so far we have 10. That's because, that's because we're presenting to our Chamber of Commerce doing overdose recognition and prevention in the Loxone trainings to our Chamber of Commerce at the breakfast events. We're going to businesses. So far, we've trained 250 businesses in our community on these. Every business on high, in high overdose areas has naloxone. We've been working with statewide policy and advocacy with our legislation on easier access to naloxone and to make sure that the gatekeeping stops. It should not cost an arm and a leg to save people's lives. And we also have uh, established a crisis response team with our law enforcement now too, where people in recovery ride along with the police officers that used to uh, not want to carry Narcan. Real quick, a DEA agent made a comment about us and the people that he met in recovery that he now works with. He said, I don't think you can tie it down to one strategy that works while you guys are seeing such a reduction when the rest of your state is seeing such an increase. He said, but all I know about you people is when you step up to the bat, you swing 100%. He's like. So you might strike out, but you sure hit a, long home, a lot of home runs. I'm so in awe of you, Seth, and Kansas. I mean, can we get a round, a round of applause for Kansas and Seth? So we have about six minutes, and we would be happy to take some questions. If, um, I don't know how, should we do it? We're going to do hands? OK, you, go, you can go first. We got a mic. Got the mic guy. Um, so I wanted to go back to what you were talking about in, in uh, terms of, of keeping uh, Narcan in all of the houses. Like, I'm an alumni. We have Narcan in, in our house. Uh, but I was wondering, and I guess this is kind of a two-person question with uh, World Council. Is there a um, plan to implement that into the manual so that we can uh, require houses to have um, Narcan? So it's funny that you asked that, because... <laughs> oh, if we could just so, leave quietly. So just it's quiet. funny that you asked that, um, because previously it was a resolution that all houses should have Narcan. Um, this year at our summit, we uh, revamped that to not only having Narcan, but also doing wellness checks. 
when they reviewed that, they thought it was so important that they are actually going to make that as an addition to the manual. Wow. My name's Royce, I'm from Alabama. Um, so I want to start it off saying I am not anti-suboxone. Uh, I am for it. So when I ask this question, I want to be thinking I'm up here anti suboxone But I will not be naive to, enough to say that like, I see a problem in where I'm at. Uh, and if I'm uneducated, you know, do tell me now. But so we have had people go in, in, our, in our city that were not opiate users and admitted that they were not opiate users. They were just an alcoholic but they are getting prescribed three strips a day. So it's such a touchy subject because we, it is saving lives, but at the same time, people are abusing that situation where they can go get it. And there's nothing that I know of that we can do about it. I'm not trying to play doctor, but from what I understand, it, it is for an opiate addiction. And so I, I guess I, for a lot of people around my city have that question, like how do we handle such a touchy subject would, would, but you know it's a problem. You want me to take that? Okay. You want to go? I can. Yeah. Go, um, go for it. So, I, and I'll be quick, but the, uh, there was an incident where an individual who had been incarcerated for like nine years um, came out of incarceration, uh, was not an opiate user previous to being incarcerated, uh, and after two months being in an Oxford house was prescribed one of these medications uh, and you know the question came up well why does he need it now um, and the answer was we don't know what anybody truly needs you know those conversations take place between the individual and the doctor right. um, so in your situation um, how do you the question is how do you address that well I mean, that's been questions that we've asked like you know what I'm saying like just people like I know they're just which we dealt with the behaviors, people nodding out. We just dealt with that recently, and, and it's gotten very serious with the willingness to do the narcan. I've actually walked in and found my roommate over there. He's been sober three years, and, and uh, he just decided to relapse, and he didn't do our wellness check-in that day, and it just so happens during a cookout that night, we offered him a plate, but like, it was too late. So, like, we've had a situation where we dealt with the behaviors, but it just seems like people are just... Doctor changed, like the doctors, like we got one girl that she don't live with and live in the house no more, but she was not even going to the doctor. Like she was having her mom and mother stuff from Florida. Sure. To Alabama, so just, yeah, you know, I think the, the main thing that we need to focus on is we're recovery housing. Um, and if individuals are doing things like that, more than likely they're not practicing a program of recovery. It would probably come out in behaviors, house meetings, address this. Hey, you know, that's not what we're identifying here is, you know, the way to do this. You know, you, you can't have your medication sent from your mother, you know, to the house. We need to figure that out. So uh, I think you're going to have to just approach any of those situations with an open mind. Um, talk as a house, address it as a house, um, and really truly focus on recovery. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with, with, without that, you know, there's going to be hundreds and thousands of problems, but if we do throw the recovery aspect in, I think we can navigate through most anything. There's no blanket response, but at each individual case will be different. But uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All the answers are in the manual, you know. No, seriously, you know. Are they? Are they like well said? Are they living a program of recovery, you know? And if they're not, maybe they don't belong there. And it's not all about medication, you know. Um, who has the mic next? Me. Um, so since we're not allowed to discriminate against medication, right? Are we allowed to accept people that are on Xanax and Adderall and? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Are they in recovery? All right, thank you guys. I appreciate your help. Um, if an individual is in recovery, 
then the medication that they're being prescribed from a doctor is acceptable. But there's a huge difference between recovery. Well, that's where you can't, we couldn't really tell because they went to rehab and they weren't taking it while they were there because rehab doesn't allow you to take those certain medications. And then they come back out and then they want to get back on it. But Speaking, so I wasn't on it in uh, rehab. I worked with a psychiatrist, a therapist, so I'm in recovery. So it took nine months for me to get put back on a stimulant for my ADHD. Okay. But I worked a program and I still work a program. Right. So there's a difference between somebody just wanting to get back on it like they say that. Yeah. I started taking a medication when I had seven years in recovery, okay. you know? Um, it's not narcotic, but that's not, you know, it's just our needs change over the recovery process. And at your house meetings, you should be looking for, is this person practicing a program of recovery in our home? Okay. So if someone's on Adderall and is not practicing a program of recovery in their home, they're not in recovery. Yeah. And you may ask them to leave at that point. Okay. Thank you for your help. Right. Um, um, this is, was the mic, sorry. This is actually just a statement for the uh, Suboxone. Uh, I think when you're prescribed it as, they give you three strips, and in my opinion, that's a little much. Um, but if you ask the person maybe to drop down a little bit to maybe try to take two doses, I know you say you're not a playing doctor, but that's a lot to take for one person because when I was first put on it, I was put on three pills or three, yeah, three strips yeah, a day. Not. And that is a lot. So I don't know what to say about that, but if there's anything you could do about that, that would be, that would be something you might want to try to do. Hey, just want to clarify something real quick. If that, does, if that situation does come up, like you had commented on, uh, have the house meeting, address it with the individual, let them deal with that with their doctor. You know, we don't need to tell anybody to take less or things of that sort. I just want to clear that up a little bit. Does that end, Michael? Okay, so that's the end of the panel. If, if you um, have any additional, we can hang out for a, a couple if, if they want to. No pressure. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, we're clapping.